This is our second Sunday of the new year, and uh, next week we'll be back in the book of Romans, uh, and, and just continuing on back in our expositional teaching, but uh, I have to believe that it's the Lord's will that has led us to this uh, message titled The War of 2024, and I'm not talking about uh, countries, bombs, missiles, and uh, politics. Uh, those things will play themselves out before us this year, uh, and God knows, but I'm talking about uh, the war of 2024 regarding you and I, the believer, as Christians. And I told you guys, and I'm going to say it again, um, this church uh, is a large church. I'm not, I don't know if I'm a fan of that. I'm not playing with you when I say that. Uh, most pastors live to have a big church. They know not what they do in their request. But I'm not interested in numbers. I'm interested in, listen, absolutely delivering this year, 2024, uh, the necessary goods that will cause you to grow deeper in your discipleship with Jesus Christ. That's what we must achieve in the year 2024. It will not be uh, compromise. It will not be uh, some uh, type of effort to get people in. I'm going to do my best to do everything to get people out. And when I say that, truth does that. I don't have to be ugly and mean about it. I just have to deliver the truth. And if the truth goes out, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, they follow me. And a stranger, they will not follow. And so if somebody wants to follow games and, and some other kind of a thing, this is not the church for you. And um, I'm not saying that to be any way bombastic or, or, or crude. I'm telling you, time is quickly running out, and you can feel it, you can sense it, it's a deep sense of urgency, that like never before, we need to live out our Christianity, and that will be met with opposition. Just wake up to that reality now, and every believer is experiencing that reality now in this era more than any other time. I've been a Christian now for a very long time, coming up on, well, just shy of 50 years as a Christian, and I'm telling you right now that I have never seen days like we're seeing today, and yet, if I were to judge these days against the days of three years ago, that looked like a picnic. Three years before that, we were on cruise control, but now we are deep into the war of so many things. And so, church, I'm going to ask you to stand as we read our theme passage together. Of course, all of it's dialed down to verse 21, but we'll read it together. I'll start in verse 14. If you read in verse 15, i got to tell you, you guys are first service, um, but just, um, it's, it's because I love you. The second and third service, have, they've been reading louder than you guys. <laughs> I know. Wish you, you wish you could be here to experience it. But um, I, don't want you, I don't want you guys to be outdone because um, you're first service. You're a special place in my heart, first service. Um, plus, first service is what's broadcast uh, on TV. So, which, by the way, up front, be careful what you're doing up front because it goes on TV. I'm serious. <laughs> Got to be discreet about things like this. We hear it. We get letters. <laughs> this is the word of God. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. Comfort the faint-hearted. Uphold the weak. Be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone what is good and for all. That was loud. One of the shortest, but most powerful, one of the most powerful and certainly the shortest verses in the Bible. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Father, we pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Wow, you may be seated. I'm impressed. 
that theme, that passage of scripture, the key verse that comes out for us in this year of 2024 is verse 21. And it's that verse that says, test all things, hold fast to what is good. And we are to be a very discerning people with Bible open, eyes wide open, judging everything according to the word of God. As we get into this study, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 through 7 is a very powerful uh, encourager. In fact, I just, before coming out, I just signed a Bible that's being shipped off, I think, to Japan to a soldier uh, that has requested uh, a one-year Bible. And I, and I wrote down this uh, passage. Watch this. Verse 4, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Wow that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Verse 6, the hardworking farmer must first be partaker of the crops. Verse 7, consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. What a great passage of scripture that is regarding our engagement In the year 2024, church, this is what we've looked at thus far, that there's going to be a war, as you know, against the truth. That was number one, a war against the truth. Last week, number two, we looked at there's going to be a war against the facts. The truth is the truth. Facts is what's being reported, what was witnessed, what was actually the thing that transpired. But there's a war against that. Thirdly, we learned that there's a war against faith. That if you're going to stand and have true biblical faith, you will be at odds with this world. But we learned last week that you ought to rejoice because Jesus made it clear that if we are living for him, we will not be loved by this world. Can you all get that under your belt? It's just the way it's going to be. And so faith is being waged against in this war. We also learned that the church is under attack. There's the the war against the church. That's why you're seeing really what I would consider the public or the visible breakup, watch me, the breakup of the, air quotes, church. Because the, air quote, church is being separated, separated away from the true church of God. And it's going on right now all around the world. Don't worry about it. You don't need to lose sleep about it. But... The great thing, Jesus says that he, being the very salvation of God, that the gates of hell would what? Not prevail against his church. His church will never be defeated. You say, Jack, yeah, but what? there's people being burned to death in Africa and and killed. And yes, but that doesn't mean they're defeated. That's only in this world. And then last time we saw... The war against marriage. We didn't spend much time on that, but there's elements of these coming points that will touch on that. The war against marriage. Marriage is being mocked, ridiculed. Kids today, listen, there are more people now living together in the United States without marriage than any other time in our nation's history. They don't believe in it anymore. They look at maybe mom and dad's broken marriage and they say, I'm not going to do that. I lived through that. And I'm not going to do that. I want to be able to be in a relationship that I can walk out of any time. No harm, no foul. And marriage has been mocked, ridiculed, attacked. And it is obvious that our government over the years, maybe perhaps decades, have even been part and parcel of the attack on marriage. It's tragic. I do believe, I may be wrong about this, but I do believe the, um, that the... Uh, legal establishment uh, was first made in California, and I'm losing the term in my mind right now, but it's uh, easy, easy, say it again, no-fault marriage. No-fault divorce, sorry, yes, no-fault divorce. I believe that was created in California, if if my memory serves me right, and uh, no-fault, no-fault, and listen, that might be fine if you're running a business, but when children are involved, And when others are involved, but most importantly, because it's marriage, God is involved. We talked about how it's a holy institution created by God. No matter what man tries to do to it, God will not change his mind no matter what any court says. So number six, here's where we jump in, everybody. You ready for this? 
You're not, believe me. <laughs> the war of 2024 is against the husband. Yep, uh, he says, oh, oh. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. We, uh, we referenced this verse last week, but we'll look at it again because it applies to this sixth point. Husbands, listen. Uh, how many of you are Christian? Guy, first of all, just men. Men, men only. Uh, men, raise your hands if you're a Christian. If you're not, don't put your hand up if you're not. I'm going to see any lightning strikes in the sanctuary here. Um, how many of you men raising your hands are husbands? Raise your hands. Wow. Okay. Put your hands down. So, listen. Husbands, love your wives. Is that an option? Nope. It's a command. Just as Christ, and here's the example. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. The husband is to give himself for his wife. And all the women said? Amen. That he might, say, watch this, he might sanctify her and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. The husband is to wash his wife with the Bible. You say, wash his wife with the Bible? What does that mean? The husband is to lead the home in the word of God. Now, I know that scares a lot of men away. A lot of men are maybe they're not public speakers. They don't have the personality to, to be outgoing. It has nothing to do with that. If you can read, and even if you can't read, if you could point to the word, listen, to simply pick up a scripture or a chapter in the Bible and read it to your wife, or better yet, for you and your wife to go to bed like this, or to spend a moment in your morning like this, where you're going through a book. Let's say John's Gospel, and chapter 1, verse 1. Husband, read verse 1 out loud. Wife, read verse 2 out loud. Husband, read verse 3 out loud. Wife, read verse 4 out loud. I think you, you get where I'm going with this? And... Um, just try that as of today, starting now. Start doing that. Watch what happens. It's quite remarkable, quite powerful. Verse 27, that he might present her to himself a glorious church. So notice how God mingles the relationship between a husband and his wife with Jesus Christ and his church. It's, it's remarkable because according to this scripture, what is implied is that there's no greater example on earth of God Christ's relationship to the church than the husband in relationship to his wife. No wonder why marriage is under attack. Billy Graham once said, if a Christian couple gets a divorce, then he said, I would understand why the unbeliever would not come to faith in Christ. That's a terrifying statement. And yet the damage that a broken home does. Now, I'm, I'm very partial to this argument about Husbands, I'll tell you why in a moment. But that verse goes on to say, for her to have having uh, no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. He's talking about the church. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. That's not a carnal statement, of course. It's coming from the lips of Jesus. It means that if you want to have a good life, treat your wife well. If you don't have a good life with your wife, it's probably because you're not treating her well. Now, I know some of you are going to try to tackle me after service and say, you don't know who I'm living with. <laughs> I just know this, that if you're a believer, husband, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. He has granted you the power, listen, to conquer your wife's fears or her doubts or even her atheism by love. Love covers a multitude of sins. You could be married to Satan's sister and still win her to Christ. <laughs> Is it tough? Is it hard? Absolutely. But we have no option. No option at all. By the way, men, regarding no options, in Proverbs 18, verse 21, the Bible says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. On Friday, I was talking to a young woman and she had mentioned the fact that uh, regarding their marriage, and they've got a 10-month-old child, and it got onto the conversation about a friend of hers, married, very depressed, very browbeaten, uh, not physically touched, but verbally dismantled by her husband. And I, I told this person, I said, you know, being involved in ministry, you can spot an abused wife, an abused woman a mile away. 
You can see it without even them saying a word. You can see it, how they walk, their posture, their eyes, their demeanor, sometimes by even how they keep themselves. They're completely, completely withered away. And we want to search our hearts in this year to ask ourselves as husbands, am I giving out life or death with the power of my tongue? Our tongue has the ability to transform a person's life. To transform a person's life. You tell somebody, listen, you tell somebody, you can do this, you know? Just work hard at it. You can do this. There's a young girl, and I'll be, quote, I'll be, I'll be quick on this. There's a young girl who grew up here in the homeschool network, and uh, now she's uh, an adult and all, but she was, by her own confession, she was never exceptionally smart, but she worked hard. She always just got by the test. She passed, just passed. And then she just passed in junior high, and then she just passed in high school. And then she just passed at Liberty University. Then she just passed at Regent University. And then she just passed her California bar exam. She just passed getting to be a federal prosecutor for the United States government. And then she just passed now moving out of the work of the government to work for a nonprofit organization that defends the U.S. Constitution. She never gave up. And let me tell you, that is an awesome thing because every chance that we had as a church to say to her, keep going, don't give up, don't look back, you can do this. She never thought she could, but we did. If God is working in your life, he's going to do an amazing thing. So listen, when it comes to our mouths, husbands, keep this in mind. The tone of our voice matters. Us guys, we need to work on this. We have to work on this. We have to work on this. We say, I'll never be like my dad. And then you grow up and you find yourself saying, oh my goodness, I just said exactly what my dad used to say to me. Isn't that weird? It's called learned response behavior. We have to fight that with the truth of God's word. And one of it is the tone of your voice. You could say, I love you. And it's not going to warm anybody's heart. <laughs> the words are right. The tone is wrong. <laughs> Secondly, guys, we need to be careful about the words we use. Now, this is a toughie. Because we need to know our wife to know how to talk to our wives. And most of us as men, we have a hard time with that. We have to study them. And um, in fact, 1 Peter 3, verse 7. Now, listen, everybody. You guys listening? Husbands, likewise, dwell with your wives or with them with understanding. That's impossible <laughs> without God. It is. Come on, be honest. It's impossible to dwell with your wife with understanding without God. Because you'll never understand your wife because only God can understand her. And then God will tell you what you ought to do. And then it all works. Giving honor to those wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life. That Listen, men, that your prayers may not be hindered. Wow. How many men pray, but God's not listening because their relationship with their wife stinks. And they think they're praying. God's not listening. The tone of our voice, the words that we use, and the attitude of our face. You say, the attitude of your face? Yep. Do you know that, and, and I'm really bad about this, I don't mean this, but um, sometimes when I'm listening or sometimes there's a thought going on in my head, I'll get this look on my face and poor, it's just, it's, I'm thinking. <laughs> and then people in the room in the meeting, they think I'm upset. Why, why, why did you think I was upset? You didn't say anything. I was thinking. <laughs> but have you ever thought about our face communicating something? There's a look on our face. Now, how many of you have kids? Raise your hands if you have kids. How many of you have more than two kids? Raise your hands. So isn't it funny? You can have this face and talk to one daughter and talk to the other daughter exactly the same way with the same face, and it's received or responded to completely differently. You must seek God for his understanding in relationships, men, Husbands, 
And then, fourthly, there's the environment or atmosphere of your presence. When you come into the room, do you suck the love and life out of the room? Are, when you come into the room, is she glad to see you? When you come home from work, gentlemen, husbands, when you come home from work, if she's there before you, she has the house, whatever's going on, she, but she's, she's there. When you come in, are you throwing the keys, kicking the cat, biting the dog? <laughs> hey, you know what? I think it's okay that even if a man came into his home, the husband came into his home, and he had a bad day for him to just go walk up to her and say, hey, just give me a squeeze, will you? Just stand here for a minute. I had a day from the pit. But we've got to communicate. We've got to share. But there's a war against the husband to shut it up and to not share and to not care. Right now, you say, well, pastor, my marriage isn't perfect. Listen, just know this. Your marriage is under the attack of Satan himself. And if he can't get through to the wife, we'll talk about you gals in a moment. But right now we're talking about the husbands. We will go after the husband. And we want to make sure that doesn't happen. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33 is an action item. An action item. We just learned in 1 Peter 3, 7 that we need to give honor to our wives. Ephesians 5.33 says, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. You know what the beautiful thing about that is? If he loves her, guys, listen, my wife doesn't respect me. I have the answer. The Bible says, love on her. She'll start respecting you. It might take months. There's no option. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 16. And how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? By how we love on them. And in that situation with the Corinthians, Paul is referring to a home where somebody, it implies that husband and wife were not saved. They were not Christians, but one of them got saved. And the debate was this, I'm a Christian now, my husband's not, I guess I'm supposed to leave him. And Paul the Apostle said, no, you don't. No, you don't. God hates divorce, even where there's non-believers, he hates divorce. And so he gives you the tools and the plan on how to work it out. Now, in some cases, I need to make this very clear. In some cases, tragically, divorce is inevitable. But there are biblical rules for all of that. But you no longer being excited about your wife is not rules for divorce. That is a very serious issue with God. Number seven, the war of 2024 is the war against the wife. Not only the husband, but of course Satan is an equal opportunity attacker. But against the wife also. Think about it this way. You've got a husband and a wife. And Satan walking around. Imagine, he's walking around. And he's checking doors, see if they're unlocked. Is the window open a little bit? Just to get a little bit in there. And by the way, he's very clever at getting small things in. He's very good. Have you ever had a splinter, a splinter that you can barely see in between your fingernails? Your fi between your fingernail and your finger? I mean, that'd, seriously, that'd, that'd make a grown man hurt. Cry. Yeah, that's the word. I didn't want to say it, but. <laughs> and it gets all festered. Have you ever had it happen where it's feverish? It's so infected and it's pussy and ouchy and yikes. Satan does that stuff. Think about that. Little bit of this. Feelings hurt, emotions dash, expectations. Yeah. It could be something as subtle as you thought you had a date, but you had the weekends mixed up. <laughs> I thought it was next weekend. No, it was today. The enemy goes to work. He'll find anything. But he'll come after the wife. The Bible is, by the way, full of scripture where the wife is one of Satan's particular targets. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 4. You guys okay? Yes. Proverbs 12, verse 4 says, An excellent wife is the crown of her husband. What a powerful verse. Listen to this. The word in Hebrew for crown, it means the surrounding wreath of beauty that goes around his head. An excellent wife is the beauty that surrounds her husband's head. 
That's honor. Proverbs 18, verse 22, regarding the wife, the Bible says, listen up, young men. Young men today are saying, I don't want to get married. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 22, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Wow. Don't you want God to favor your life? Don't be surprised if God starts favoring your life by bringing you a godly woman. But guys, that means you have to ask, you have to, listen, <laughs> guys, Christian men, 35 years of age and under, listen up. You see a Christian girl, you, you think she's attractive? Yeah, I do. She's over there. She's over there. She sits over there every, serv- every Sunday. Yeah? What are you going to do about it? What do you mean? Go ask her out for coffee. Go up to her and say, hi, how are you? My name is so-and-so. What's your name? Some of us older people are saying, what is he even wasting his time on this for? You have no idea. This is not a waste of time. Men need to go and say, hey, I'm just, would you like to go get some coffee? But see... (laughs) Exactly. <laughs> First Peter 3, 4. First Peter 3, verse 4 says, Likewise, wives, be subject. That word means follow the lead. Watch this. To your own husbands. So that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word. That is won over. Without a word by the conduct of their wives. Are you married to a non-believer? Win him to Christ. Don't compromise your convictions and don't compromise your conscience. Obey the word of God, but love on him. Maybe kind words, maybe, I don't know, a Twinkie or a cookie in his lunchbox. I don't know what the deal is. You know him. But the Bible here says that there's a power in a godly wife, even leading her unbelieving husband to Christ. What a remarkable truth. Verse 2 says, And when they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external. This is so awesome. Please, everybody, listen. Do not let your adorning be external. It doesn't mean don't, don't present yourself beautiful. Present yourself beautiful. Remember, what, I'm going to blame this on J. Vernon McGee. Anybody remember J. Vernon McGee? <laughs> J. Vernon McGee said regarding this verse, this does not mean for women to not take care of themselves. And then he says, inevitably, the question will be brought up, can a Christian woman wear makeup? And J. Vernon McGee says, if the barn needs painting, paint it. (laughs) By the way, us guys, we should probably do a few sit-ups or two along the way as well. He's not talking about don't look pretty and don't make yourself presentable. I think a beautiful woman glorifies God. You say, well, I'm not, I'm not beautiful. You can make yourself beautiful. Listen, I'm telling you right now. I've told you guys this before. Young people, again, listen up. I don't care how handsome he is or how beautiful she is. After about an hour, a week, or a month of talking to them, they either get more handsome and more beautiful, or they start to grow ugly. Because the inside starts to come out in conversation. And it's like, (laughs) ugh. There's nothing you can do about that, by the way. That verse in 1 Peter 3 goes on to say that, do not let your adorning be external to braiding of hair or the putting on of gold jewelry. It doesn't say you can't. It says don't look to these things to define or make who you are or the clothing that you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is in God's sight is very precious. Isn't that beautiful? On this topic, I'll just add that I believe there's nothing more beautiful than a Christian woman. 
There's only one thing I should say more beautiful than a Christian woman, and I don't know why this is true, but it is a Christian woman who's pregnant. I don't understand why that's true. They just glow. It's like, you got a baby in there or you got a lighthouse in there? (laughs) There's just a joy about them. There's just a light about them. But you say, I don't know about, I don't know if I believe what you're saying. Then why does the world seek to do everything it can to rob a godly woman of her virginity or of her purity or from her marriage or from her being honorable? The world hates women. And if if that statement wasn't true, then where are all the feminists right now defending abused women? And where are the feminists regarding human trafficking? Where are they? Why are the Christians the ones standing up trying to fight it? Proverbs chapter 31. Do we have time for this passage? This is a whopper. It's worth it. And it's the word of God, right? Look at this. This is the best. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her. So he will have no lack of gain. That's an amazing statement that has a sermon all by itself. A man is not very productive if he doesn't trust his wife. That is a fact. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She's industrious. She is like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion of her maidservants. She's got employees. This is an amazing woman. She considers a field and she buys it. Guys, this is the kind of woman you want. John Adams said, you need to find a woman who can take the head off of a chicken, prepare it, and chop wood. (laughs) That's what they looked for in a wife in 1772. I think that's awesome, though, verse 16. She buys property. From her profit, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good. She's committed to quality. Excellence. And her lamp does not go out by night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff. It's a part of a spindle or a a weaving machine. And her hand holds the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household. For all her household is clothed with scarlet. She's she's made preparations. She makes tapestries for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is, watch this, her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. Have you ever heard this? Listen, behind every good man is a? Yeah, there is, there's no way you can be a good man without a good wife standing behind you surrounding you, encouraging you. Sometimes in my life, a good wife picking me up off the floor to get me back uh, to stand in the pulpit again because after every Wednesday and Sunday, I feel like I've just butchered the Bible. By the time I get home, Lisa's got to scoop me back up again. You're not quitting. You're going to get into... <laughs> it's funny because, you know, after you serve up a meal, you always wonder, do they choke on it? Was it, did it t- could they taste God in it? The, the word, you don't want to be near me after a third service on a Sunday afternoon. But Lisa picks me up. And uh, she, Lisa's Lisa. She'll pick me up and then she'll say, get a hold of yourself. It's God's word. It's not your word. His word never returns void. It's awesome. Great wife. Hard to find. And it goes on to say that, uh, verse 24, she makes linen garments and sells them. Notice how much of this is... Um, Oh, this is going to be great. This gets some people upset. How much of this is a free market trade? Yes. No, notice this. How much of this is, uh, is capitalism? She makes stuff, she sells it. She turns around, she hires people. Capitalism is a biblical reality, by the way. Socialism is anti-God. 
anti-human, to be honest with you. Verse 25, strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Wow. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. What an awesome, awesome woman. You find that woman, don't let her go. I had, I had vowed to God when I became a Christian. I was going to make money, live at the beach, and never get married. <laughs> that was my plan. I'm not joking. And then Lisa walks by. <laughs> Interesting, though. We, she, we were at the beach. I was playing volleyball. She was walking by with a friend, and my friend said, Jack, that's a Christian girl. I know her from school. She, she was in high school when I met her. And I said, nope, no such thing. <laughs> and he goes, no, 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 I'm serious. No, nope, no, nope, don't, don't bother me with that. And I don't know, man, after about three weeks, I, our first date was to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And then after about three weeks, I'm out shopping for a wedding ring. Why? Because I found a good thing. And the thought of me, so well, how'd you know? I, I thought this thought. Okay, she's disrupting my plan. So, can I walk away from her without looking back? Can I just walk away from this? Can, can I walk away knowing God's not in it? Are you hearing me? I could not walk away. So then the rest was easy. If you can't walk away, go forward. And then we talk about men. There's a war on men today. I believe that one of the biggest battles raging in our culture, if not the world today, against humanity is the origins and the doctrines of Satan, and they are specifically directed at men. Do you, uh, you might find this interesting. Those of you who are in the OBGYN, maybe uh, the uh, delivery room, hospital, med uh, medical world, um, how many more... Uh, how many more uh, Kids are born of what gender? Are there more male or females born? Anybody know? Females born. More females are born. Why is that the case? Do you know why that's the case? Did you know that from the moment of conception, just about everything possible goes against the male child in the womb? Did you know miscarriage, miscarriages are mostly male, boy? Did you know that? It's weird. But from the start, it seems like there's a war on men. Now, we know there's a war on women because Satan went after Eve. He just flat out hates us all. The good thing about it is Satan never has a good day. I rejoice in that. <laughs> but every man is to know what the Bible has to say about what it is to be a man. The creator God of the universe made us to be a, uh, men to fulfill that calling. And we know that it's a very serious thing in our world today when there's a lack of men. It has to be changed. And you can't change the whole world in a minute, but you can change your home in a minute just by the way the direction is changed. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us, the Trinity, make man in our image. That's mankind. Always want to say this, it gives me a little bit more self-worth. Everybody, uh, let, let us make man in our image. It's kind of fun to, to think about this fact that the first woman came out of a man. Now, I'm not advocating men giving birth. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> but Eve came out of Adam. That's the one and only time, by the way, that ever happened. God had a plan. Genesis 1, verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image, and in, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so the lie that is advancing today against men 
is something of this nature. Men cannot be strong. That's rude, ugly, and toxic. Can't be strong. Now, I've not been to a health club in about 20 years, maybe 30 years, but are there any men who go to health clubs anymore? Do they work out anymore? I hope so, anyway. Maybe. We'll see. If you're a man, you can't be the leader anymore. Men can't lead. Men cannot, men not allowed to be strong. Men are not allowed to be the leader. And men cannot have an opinion anymore. Not allowed. Whatever we say, it's the wrong thing. It's sexist. It's chauvinistic. It's, it's, it's racist. It's, friends, The entire human culture is under attack by satanic powers. Don't let people, as I said last week, drive the narrative, know that there's powers behind them. And men cannot know what they're on the planet for. There are books written by feminists who talk about how a world without men would be just fine. (laughs) Until your toilet plugs up. But then they would say our toilet would never plug up if there were. <laughs> hey, I want to have you put your eyes to the screens for a second. Rape, murder, war. They all have one thing in common. Men. Aggression, violence, ambition unchecked by conscience. All the stuff of toxic masculinity, right? And the solution is obvious. Make men less toxic. Make men less masculine. Make men more like women. But I'm here to tell you that that way of thinking is not only wrong, it's dangerous. Here's why. When you try to make men more like women, you don't get less toxic masculinity. You get more. Why? Because bad men don't become good when they stop being men. They become good when they stop being bad. Aggression, violence, and unbridled ambition can't be eliminated from the male psyche. They can only be harnessed. And when they are harnessed, they are tools for good, not for harm. The same masculine traits that bring destruction also defeat tyranny. The traits that foster greed also build economies. The traits that drive men to take foolish risks also drive men to take heroic risks. The answer to toxic masculinity isn't less masculinity. It's better masculinity. And we know what that looks like. It's a young man opening the door for a girl on their first date. It's a father working long hours to provide for his family. It's a soldier risking his life to defend his country. The growing problem in today's society isn't that men are too masculine. It's that they're not masculine enough. When men embrace their masculinity in a way that is healthy and productive, they are leaders, warriors, and heroes. When they deny their masculinity, they run away from responsibilities leaving destruction and despair in their wake. The consequences can be seen everywhere. One in four fathers now lives apart from his children, and children who grew up without a dad are generally more depressed than their peers who have a mother and a father. They are at far greater risk for incarceration, teen pregnancy, and poverty. 71% of high school dropouts are fatherless. Of all the rocks upon which we build our lives, family is the most important and we are called to recognize and honor how critical every father is to that foundation. That was said by then-Senator Barack Obama in 2008. If we are honest with ourselves, he went on, we'll admit that too many fathers are missing from too many lives and too many homes. As much as we try to deny the need for real masculine strength in society, there's no denying its necessity. Healthy families and strong communities depend on the leadership and bravery of good men. Yet, the current trend is to feminize young men in the hopes of achieving some utopian notion of equality and peace. And it starts at the earliest ages. In the school classroom, boys are invariably the problem. On the playground, aggressive games like dodgeball have long been banished. We tell young men that their intrinsic desire to compete is wrong. Everybody gets a trophy. Don't run up the score. This anti-male tilt continues on through higher education and into the workplace. It has created millions of tentative men, unhappy women, and confused boys and girls. Here's a secret that every woman knows. Women want real men. Men they can count on and yes, look up to. 
No amount of feminist theory will change that. I don't know any woman at any age who is attracted to a passive man who looks to her to be his provider, protector, and leader. Every woman I know wants a strong, responsible man. That's not a consequence of a social construct or cultural pressure. It's innate. The devaluation of masculinity won't end well because feminine passive men don't stop evil. Passive men don't defend, protect, or provide. Passive men don't lead. Passive men don't do the things we have always needed men to do for society to thrive. In his book, The Abolition of Man, English social philosopher C.S. Lewis writes about this problem. He describes the tension between cerebral man and visceral man. By his intellect, Lewis explains, man is mere spirit and by his appetite, mere animal. We need both. Take away one and you're left with a man who's either weak or wicked. And in a world of wickedness, weak men are nothing more than enablers of wicked men. Mm. Rape, murder, war. They all have two things in common. Bad men who do the raping, murdering, and warring, and weak men who won't stop them. We need good men who will. It's not masculinity that's toxic. It's the lack of it. I'm Ali Stuckey for Prager University. Great. Can't say it better than that. Number nine, the war of 2024 against women. A person honestly is either insane or ill who cannot recognize that a woman is God's special creation. Special engineering. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him or comparable to him. That word in Hebrew, by the way, for comparable or comparable, that word means to be conspicuous. I love this. Everybody listen up. You guys asleep? Did that darkness put you? Listen. The woman, the wife, you can put them together to be conspicuous. Think about what comes to your mind about conspicuous. Obvious. An ally. Listen, a wife, a woman to a man is to be the answer. We don't hear that very often. One who encourages, informs, denounces. God said it's not good for a man to be alone. Why? Because there's times when a man is going to need a woman in his life to denounce him. <laughs> you can't do that. Displays, explains, to give evidence to, to inform, to speak plainly. Isn't that funny? If you're married, that situation, you're, you're reading those words and you're going, boy, I'm always being given the evidence of, I'm denounced, uh, she's informing me constantly. Uh, <laughs> listen, like everything in this fallen world, you've got to see what's good and what's not good, what can be fixed and what should be embraced. The Bible tells us over and over again, Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, and Adam called his wife, his name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. What a powerful statement. But our world is at war with women, and it's a tragedy. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3 says, but I fear, says Paul, lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupt from the simplicity that is in Christ. A woman from the beginning is created altogether to be different than the man. I don't care what any high school teacher is telling any of your kids. Men and women are different. And it seems as though that God saved the best for last, in my opinion. I don't mean to throw any of us guys under the bus. In God's eternal plan, Adam was to be created first for purposes that the Bible explains, and there's other purposes we don't know yet. <laughs> but one of the answers to man's weakness was the woman being in his life. No woman should apologize for being a woman. No woman, no young lady, no girl in school or anywhere else should be told by somebody else that she's not. That is ill 
for a school or for someone of authority to tell a five-year-old that they're not a boy or a girl anymore, in my opinion, should be arrested at least, which I guess in our world now, that doesn't turn out to do much, but it is certainly a form of mental abuse, to say the least. You want to rock the world and you want to bless your own life, decide today to become a woman of God. You have great examples. You have people like Abigail, amazing woman of God. Do a biographical study on these women of God. Deborah, she's one of my heroes. Sarah, Rebecca, and of course, what about Mary? Mary had to be amazing. For the angel Gabriel to bring the message from God to say that you're the most blessed among all women on earth. She must have been amazing. Number 10, I'm going to go quick now because I'm out of time. Number 10, the war on 2024 is against children, obviously against children. Proverbs 22 verse 6 tells us, train up a child in the way that he should go or she should go, doesn't matter. And when he is old or she is old, they will not depart from it. Parents and parenting, listen. Kids must see biblical masculinity and biblical femininity while they're growing up. God created the family for a reason. That's why Satan hates it. Children are the target in all the areas of life. Listen, everybody, you're not going to like what I'm about to say, but prove me wrong. Why is it that every communist regime recorded in history, why is it that every totalitarian dynasty throughout recorded human history their number one goal was to seize control of the children. Did you know that the, the armies, the moms and the dads got in the way of their ultimate target? They wanted to seize the children and make them in their own image as tyrants or socialists or Marxists. Look around our nation today. All of a sudden, things have come to the surface and the children are on the chopping block, literally. What's going on, everybody? Think about it. What's going on? Children are under attack. Satan hates them. And there's only one way, listen, there's only one way to protect and to defend our children that God has given us. He's loaned them to us. It's to show them the love of God and to train them up in the way that they should go. Do you know what that means? You're not going to like this. It's tough, honestly. I love you, but it is tough. Here's the deal. If you've got a four-year-old boy that accidentally puts on his mom's high heels because he's got sisters and he's clicking around down the hallway, that's when you go up to him and say, listen, try these on instead. Put your dad's boots on and do that. He's, oh my gosh, I, I can't believe you would say that. I'll say it again. Yeah. If, you've got, if you've got a little girl that's walking around uh, wearing her dad's boots you need to encourage her, you know what, you ought to try my high heels, honey. And let her put on the high heels. Listen to this. If you've got a little boy that is perpetually playing because he has sisters, perhaps, with Barbie, then listen, you need to take him down to the toy shop and get him something that, uh, well, G.I. Joe, I guess, is he straight still? Is he okay, G.I. Joe? <laughs> or G.I. Josephine, I don't know what he is anymore. But, and then there's some things that you ought to just get your boy and your girl together and go outside in the backyard or go to the park and with them roll around in the dirt. Get grease on your hands. Change a tire. People don't like to hear this because it's pure truth and it slaps them right in the ego. Makes too much sense. The fact of the matter is God says to the parent, Train up the child in the way that they should go. That doesn't mean make it up. It means you have a boy or do you have a girl? Then in that direction, place these tools or these items or these things in their hands. You, hey, listen, I'm going to take back a word that has been stolen. Groom them in the direction that they should go based upon God's word. Because, because the enemy of your children are out to groom them their way. Someone's going to win this battle. Someone's going to win. And God would have it to be us. Number 11, the war against all that is good. Period. We are so much deep into this war, friends. 
Just me bringing this up in a church like this, you're not even quite sure what good is anymore. The Bible says, listen to this. The Bible says 2,500 years ago. No, that's not true. 2,700 2,700 years ago, the Bible says in Isaiah 5, verse 20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitterness for sweet. See the confusion? And sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. Confusion. Confusing what is good. And then finally, the war of 20... 24 is against the pulpit. In the book of Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, the Bible says the mystery of the seven stars, this is epic. You know, by the way, I, I, Lisa and I have been talking about this, I told her about this for a while. If things just continue the way that they're, we're going, I, I, I'm just, I think I'm just going to do a, maybe a Friday night or a Sunday night or whatever something where it's just a Bible prophecy teaching night. And this... <laughs> This is one of the reasons why. This is so great. The mystery of the seven stars which you, that's John, saw in my right hand, Jesus is speaking, and the seven golden lampstands. There's a seven lampstand out there in the foyer. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. See the word angels? It doesn't mean angels. You know angels? It doesn't mean Gabriel. It means the messengers or the speakers or the pastors. Angel, Anglios, proclaimer. The seven stars are the seven proclaimers of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands, which you saw, are the seven churches. Chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel, you can say this, does no damage to it whatsoever. To the pastor of the church of Ephesus, write. Seven times Jesus says that in the book of Revelation. To the pastor of the church at Laodicea, to the pastor of the church at Philadelphia, to the pastor of the church at Thyatira. Are you hearing me? To the pastor, to the pastor, to the pastor. Why do you think the book of Revelation is at the end of the Bible? Because it's the end. And who's he dressed right from the get-go? Pastors. This may sound self-serving. I said self-serving, but in reality, it's the opposite. And I'm going to quote myself here for a second. The pastor is to be a man of God, to be the voice of God to the church and to the culture to which he's been called. The pastor's real estate matters. Location, location, location is his pulpit and where he has been placed and those who are influenced by his calling will be witnesses of it. Think of that. If a pastor is to do what they're supposed to do is point the congregation to the word of God. If that happens, the war of 2024 may not end the way the enemy would have it end. It could be that there would be revival. It could be that your marriage is saved. It could be that your children are rescued. It could be. What will it be? How will this year end? God is not waiting He's not throwing dice, ladies and gentlemen, and pastors and pulpits. How will this year end? Will be determined from the pulpit in America. That's how it's going to end. How will that be? We know how God wants it to end. Listen to what Tozer says. Again, I'm almost done. The Christian must not allow himself to be entrapped by current vogues. By the way, I think he wrote this in 1970. In religion, and above all, he must never go to the world for his message. <laughs> he is a man of heaven, sent to give witness on earth. As he shall give account to the Lord that bought him, let him see to his commission. A.W. Tozer. According to the Bible, the pulpit, number one, is the place where the truth is to be proclaimed without apology or dilution. Number two, it is the place where the church is trained in righteousness. Number three, the pulpit is the place where faith is ever increasing and developed. And number four, it is the pulpit is where the place where biblical doctrine has and is the final word. The Bible. The evidence of this living in the last days is clearly obvious by the lack of personal holiness and cultural effectiveness or the lack thereof 
from the pulpit. Churches gathering together for nothing more than a social club rather than equipping the people to confront the world that is out there to meet you tomorrow with their agenda. And, I, and listen, you can stand. I want to read you these verses. You can stand. I want to read you these verses. What, what, what can be done? Maybe you're a pastor, Christian leader. Maybe not. Maybe you're a congregant. This is what pastors and pulpits are to be held to. Jeremiah 3, verse 15. And I will give you shepherds according to my heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. That's God's will for the church. Jeremiah 23, verse 4. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them and they shall fear no more. Uh, you're going to want to remember that verse because virus X is coming. <laughs> yeah, have you heard about that yet? Yeah, it's called X. Not Twitter, but X. Virus X is coming, and not only is it supposed to be so much worse than COVID, but it appears that virus X actually goes after those, uh, somehow pursues those with vaccine properties. Don't tell me that wasn't engineered. So he says, I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. Ephesians 4, 11. And he, that is the Holy Spirit himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for edifying of the body of Christ. And then here's where I end. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. Paul turned to Timothy, or wrote to Timothy, his son in the faith, and he said, I charge you, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine." But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. Teachers, cheerleaders. I don't know what. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. I'm going to ask you to lift your hands if you're a Christian. We're going to dedicate ourselves to the Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, we lift our hands in adoration and in devotion to you. We commit ourselves to you, Father God, in Jesus' name for this year that lies ahead. We seek to divorce ourselves from ourselves and we seek, Lord God, to be so bonded to you that nothing less comes out of us than the will of God, which is the word of God, and that we commit ourselves, Lord, as you listen to us, that you would be merciful and gracious and gentle and kind, yes, but Lord, that you would be tenacious with us. Don't let us waver. God, may heaven be on record today as hearing us this day, that we have set our hands to the plow. We will not look back. We have called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We will live our lives for him and him alone. We will not fear what this world can do unto us. For greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And Father God, that we live this year granted to us by your generosity, should we finish it, may we finish it well as faithful stewards and servants of the Lord Most High. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you.